connected? I don't know. Okay. okay. The guy in is watching. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. All right, wonderful. <laughs> he, so he was here last time. I think we're, we're ready to go. Um, Welcome to this new space here. This will be where we'll spend a few hours this afternoon. Um, we have our next presenter, Thaddeus Owen. And Thaddeus is the owner and co-founder of Primal Hacker. Thaddeus is a biohacker who also studies and, and um, invests a lot of time in researching both light and nutrition. Um, he has an extensive background at, of speaking here at The Point, um, and we're excited uh, to share his wisdom and knowledge here with you all today. He's been a great friend, great colleague, um, and we appreciate all that he brings here um, in terms of wisdom, knowledge, science, um, and just humanity. The other thing about Thaddeus and why um, we love having him here is he's just a great friend to us at The Point. He's um, really looked out for The Point and helped promote us, and he's just a fantastic human being. So I hope you enjoy learning and listening and getting to know him um, over the next day or two here. And then followed uh, by Thaddeus is Heidi, who's going to be also kind of balancing our left brain, right brain activities. And she's going to be leading us in an art project um, upstairs that um, is going to be both meditative and therapeutic for us. So we'll kind of learn in different ways today, relax in different ways, and kind of and grow in different ways today. So I'm, I'm grateful for both of them for being here. And they've brought their tribe of wonderful kiddos too and they are like just awesome kids and i know they've been playing with devin and adeline and so now we've got like our own little point little tribe of little cuties running around too which is awesome and Allie, thank you for watching them so <laughs> yeah. appreciate yeah. it yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the other thing with thaddeus too um is he truthfully out of out of all the presenters and research that we've re researchers that we've had here at the point over the last couple of years he has single-handedly taught our team the most about ways that we can improve our health um, from light, circadian rhythm, EMFs. Um, he's brought a lot of new knowledge to us, which we really appreciated. And we've been able to take some simple steps that he's taught each of us and make some significant changes in our, in our own health um, and our life and, and, and wellness. So we hope that you'll also take home some of those same pearls. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Thaddeus. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Krista. Thank you. All right, are we good up here? Perfect. All right. All right. Well, Sam Richards says hi. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Tell her I said hi. Hey, Sam. Uh, okay, so I have done a lot of research over the last 20 years, and I've got a, a master's degree in nutrition. My bachelor's degree is in chemical engineering. So, again, I spent like a ton of time in edible pharmaceuticals in that world. And have done a ton of things around human performance and nutrition. So I went vegan way back in the 90s, vegetarian, ketogenic, bulletproof, uh, low fat, high carb, like everything in between I've tried. And the thing that made the most difference in my health and my life, and that was the most noticeable difference was when I started playing with light. And so on the last, I'd say two years, I've been really all in down this rabbit hole on light research and how it impacts human biology. So what I'm offering today is just an alternative view on how your environment impacts your health. And my, I guess my theory in all of this, presenting it to everybody here, is if we think about you know, like getting hit in the head with a hammer, changing your diet or taking a pill is probably not gonna stop the headache. <laughs> so I, my posit is like, figure out what's going on in your environment first and fix that. And then you can dial in all these other little things that can make really big differences. And for some people it might be food because everything else is great. Um, most of us have missed the light picture and there's such a huge amount of research coming out right now about light and human biology. So last year the Nobel Prize was given for circadian biology and how it impacts human health because it was such a big deal. So I love learning all this stuff, I geek out on it. You can stop me at any time, ask questions, dive deeper. If I don't have an answer, I'll tell you I don't know. Um, usually I have access to answers if I can't get them, but just super interested in like how you guys find this and what you're seeing in your space. I didn't get to meet everybody here, so I don't know everybody's background. So I'm gonna come at this from kind of a high level. I'll go into like a few details here and there, but we can get as detailed or as high level as you want. So really again, like. We've been told so much about food and movement that I think we're missing a little bit of the picture on the environment and especially the light environment. And some of the things that build optimal health, so mind, body, spirit, these things all still make 
100% complete sense, you have to have all those pieces and you also have to look at the environment that you're in when you're doing a lot of these things. So again, I mentioned like I've tried all of these diets except carnivore. Usually when I try some of those, I'll, I'll run labs, I'll run DEXA, I'll do experiments. I'll post those on my blog to show people how they impacted me and what I think of them, as well as the research. So carnivore is the only one I haven't done. I'll probably end up trying it for a month this year because everyone I've talked to seems to rave about that. Um, but again, like I think food is secondary after you fix your environment. Movement as well. So some people say, you know, it's about neat. So non-exercise activity, like how much do you move around during the day versus going to the gym for just two hours at a time or one hour a day, that's not enough. Maybe you need to move all day long. Um, again, if you're under a toxic environment, more movement maybe won't help you. So what I'm thinking we missed, and light is so interrelated to sleep and circadian rhythm that I'm not sure yet that you can completely separate the two, but sleep and light are the two things that a lot of people especially in our culture, tend to miss. A, because we're indoors the majority of our time, 90% of our time now is spent indoors. For those of us in a northern climate, it can sometimes be more than that. So if I think about someone in Minnesota or Wisconsin or Toronto that gets up and their car is in a garage, so they're at home, they get in their car, they drive to work, they park in a parking garage, they get into work, they leave and go to the gym, maybe the grocery store and then home, you might not be outside at all um, in some cases in our society. So that is a problem. So the light environment that you are around in an indoor environment, we've now made our habitat indoors. And unlike a zoo habitat, we're kind of like this farm habitat. Like how do we get the maximum amount of production in the shortest time, regardless of the impact to the health of the animal, us? versus a zoo environment where it's like, let's figure out the proper lighting and the right type of food and make sure you get enough movement. So we're in this kind of farm-based environment that's designed to do things anti to human health. And we're spending a lot of our time there versus outside. Sleep is the other thing in our culture where we are so focused on making a whole bunch of wealth and accumulating more social network and downplaying how much we sleep. In fact, we want to play up how little we sleep in our culture. So light, what we're finding is sets the body's circadian rhythm, our clocks in our bodies that tell us when it's time to sleep, how to get the benefits of sleep, and when it's time to be awake. When we start messing with those, we mess with both our health and our sleep. So this is what most of us know, right? So light, we think of the sunlight. So when you go out in the sun, what are we hearing over and over and over is that we need to cover up, we need to wear sunglasses, we need to protect our eyes, we need to wear sunscreen. There's these two sun rays that we hear about most often when we think about damage to human health. So damage to our skin, damage to our mitochondria, damage to our DNA from UVA and UVB rays. So then we slather on sunscreen to block some of those. Um, windows block other rays of those. We cover up with shirts and hats and pants. And that may not be the best thing to do all the time for everybody. So even if you just think about this intuitively and how it feels to you, like we either, depending on what you believe, were designed to live under the sun or evolved to live under the sun. So the sun has been with us for all of human history. Every animal, you know, that is alive during the day and lives above ground and not under the ocean is living under the sun. So if we believe that the sun is dangerous, yet we were designed to live under this and have lived under this our entire life, and we don't see other animals hiding themselves from the sun, we might start to question, you know, why are we doing that? And what are we doing in our own homes and businesses with our lighting environment that may be impacting our health? Because if we have spent hundreds of thousands of years or longer, if you think about the bacteria, the mitochondria that's in our body, those things were designed to make use of the sun in some way. And when we miss out on that, you know, what are we doing to our biology? So the analogy that I've heard, and I really kind of glammed onto this, is like if you take a tree and it's making oranges in Florida and you put a tarp over it, you know, what's going to happen to that tree? So we can see that. It's very obvious because we know plants do photosynthesis. They make energy from sunlight and water and carbon dioxide. Humans I will say also do photosynthesis, albeit in a slightly different way than plants. But when you put a tarp over a human who's designed to 
to at least make use of sun rays in certain ways, that could be a very bad thing. And adding clothing and sunscreen, being told over and over and over that the sun is dangerous, is sending a message to many of us, including our kids, that may be leading to further disease. So lack of vitamin D, lack of solar exposure, can cause lots and lots of issues from circadian rhythm entrainment, vitamin D deficiency, and we know that vitamin D is responsible for mitigating and helping with lots of disease states. The other thing that we hear about, you know, skin cancer, right? So there's, there are a few skin cancers, that's not all the way up on the screen, but there's a few skin cancers that are definitely related to solar exposure. And steroids. <laughs> and steroids, right. Just a few. <laughs> Got to get prepped for those, those uh, films. <laughs> those float so they can rescue people. So melanoma, though, is not associated with sunlight. So if you look at all the studies that have been done recently, they cannot get an association of melanoma to sunlight, but they can get an association of melanoma to blue light. And we'll talk about blue light in a little bit. But essentially, sunlight has been shown to reduce all-cause mortality. So basically, all-cause mortality is lowered in if you get more sunlight. So the people that get more sunlight have lower all-cause mortality. The people with less sunlight have higher all-cause mortality. So what does sunlight actually do? So we're just going to go at a high level. Essentially, sunlight, and, and there's a number of studies, and I've got them linked in the notes if anyone really needs a study, um, but essentially, serotonin and dopamine are released in sunlight. So we know those things happen. There's very unique ways that that happens. One of the ways is serotonin and ultraviolet light. So serotonin is made from tryptophan, and the only way that can happen is if tryptophan is coded correctly, because there's a number of pathways tryptophan can go from serotonin to melatonin. It can actually create other molecules. Um, and we're always wondering, like, how does the body know which molecule to make when? And we think that some of the information contained in sunlight and photons codes for the pathway that serotonin needs to make or tryptophan and tyrosine need to make to get to neurotransmitters and hormones. So when you're out in the sun, there's a beta endorphin effect. It makes us happier. We're releasing neurotransmitters that are responsible for happiness. So the sun kind of wants us to be addicted to being in the sunlight. It helps with development. So again, when we cover our kids up from sunlight, and I'm not saying to let them roast themselves in the sun, but safe sun exposure is absolutely critical for development of kids and their eyes. And you can't really see all these, but there's a number of studies here and basically showing all, all the cancers that can be mitigated or reduced by sun exposure. So again, some people point to the rising incidence of certain types of skin cancer, um, not melanoma not being one of them, but there are so many cancers that are mitigated by sunlight exposure and the mortality associated with skin cancers from sun exposure is very good compared to mortality rates of other cancers that sun mitigates. So the other one is for health. So a lot of people want to get more lean muscle and sunlight increases nitric oxide in the body. So both nitric oxide and vitamin D can help with muscle growth. And finally, like one of the most important things that I think is time. And most people are completely unaware of the subject of circadian rhythm and how that actually works in the body. But as sunlight enters our eyes, and we only learned in December of 2017, also our skin, there's receptors that don't code for visible light. There's you know, invisible parts of the spectrum. There's also parts of, the, parts of our eye that don't pick up light and translate it to vision they pick up light to set our circadian rhythm. Those are called melanopsin and neuropsin. So those opsins in the eye, we've known about them. Mel melanopsin codes for blue light, so it picks up blue light. And when it sees blue light, it gives information to the body that it's daytime to produce cortisol, to stop producing melatonin, to wake the body up. And then with neuropsin, it senses ultraviolet light. So as the ultraviolet light throughout the day changes, so sunrise and sunset, I'll show you a slide here, there's no ultraviolet light. So nature has already designed our bodies to really make use of the sun. So when the sun rises, there's no ultraviolet. There's red, there's infrared, there's blue. It tells our body to produce cortisol. There's a hormone cascade that happens. And then a little bit later in the day, we get ultraviolet light 
and ultraviolet light is picked up by neuropsin, and it tells our body to stop that hormone cascade and to put nitric oxide back into the mitochondrial chain to slow down electron chain transport, while the red and infrared light actually speed up um, the, the motor that makes ATP, the ATPase. So basically you're getting like, and I'll show you a slide here as well, but um, sunlight slows down the electrons going through the energy production center of our body while speeding up the production of energy with red and infrared light. So technically that's like a 100% efficient motor that's making energy without food electrons. So you can basically make some of your energy from sunlight. The theory that I've heard is two thirds of your energy can be made from sunlight, two thirds of the body's ATP. I have not been able to find like a reference to make that a fact, but that's what I've heard. So setting time clocks, when the sun enters your retina and also enters your skin, it sets the clocks in the body and every one of our cells and organs and the bacteria in our stomach, the enterocytes in our gut have clocks that work on circadian rhythm. And when they are mismatched, meaning it's the wrong time, it's the, it's the wrong time in the cells than it is during the day, we can get circadian rhythm diseases. So very important to set circadian rhythm with natural sunlight. So wearing sunglasses outdoors will block. A lot of sunglasses are, are rated to block ultraviolet light, and then they block a lot of the other wavelengths of light as well. So even if you've got glasses or sunglasses, um, what I tell people is like take those off when you're first outside to allow your body to understand what time of day it is. Now that we know melanopsin and neuropsin are in the skin, um, you, can, you can probably just uncover enough of your skin. But of course, if you're, if you're going to work and you're covered up, you want your eyes to receive that light signal. So that's a, that's a good point about sunglasses. And I've, I've got a, actually a part of my talk that, you know, I would say sunglasses are for indoors and nighttime and not outdoors during the day. So, so yeah, and we talked a little bit about information, but this is the photoelectric effect. And Einstein kind of helped create um, the theory and the, in the, um, math around the photoelectric effect, but essentially photons come from the sun. So it's like moving particles of light, which are waves and particles. They hit a surface and light has energy in it. So when that light photon hits a surface, it excites an electron because it's passing energy to an electron, whether it's the body or metal. What it's also doing that most people have never looked into and we're now finding in research is it's imparting information with that energy. So light photons contain information that our body is coded to use. So when that photon hits parts of our body and provides information that keeps us healthy, we miss all of that when we cover ourselves up and live indoors under unnatural light. So I don't know if you're going to cover it, but could you talk on like B12 in sunlight? Because I've heard like B12 is actually a photoreceptor. Yeah, so there's a number of photoreceptors. So, um, trying to think of the correct terminology, but like cytochrome C oxidase, vitamin B12, um, the VDR, the vitamin D receptor, there's a lot of those that are sunlight receptors and they are coded to do things when sunlight hits them. So like the vitamin D receptor, we don't necessarily like make vitamin D from the sun, but we have cholesterol, sulfated cholesterol in our skin that when the sunlight hits it, it changes it to a different form of sulfated cholesterol and then it goes to the liver to become the active form of vitamin D, 1,2,5-hydroxy vitamin D. Um, vitamin B, is that's correct. There's also receptors um, that work with vitamin B12 that are necessary to get out in the sun to change your B12 levels. And I have not studied the research on that. I've heard it discussed in one lecture, but I have not, I have not actually dug into that. So it's a, that's a really good question and it's something I'd like to dig into. So again, I'm like at the two-year point, and this is all quantum mechanics and quantum physics and quantum biology that we're bringing into the biology and biochemistry realm. And it's really new and it's really challenging to study all the science. So I'm like, and again, I've got a full-time job and then I try to do this and raise kids and everything else. So that's all the kind of questions that I'm really interested. Like what do people want to know about and what have you heard? So I can add that to like what I know and how to help people with some of those things. So good question. So the, some of this information that's being presented um, to your body is helping. There's a few studies that show that it preconditions our skin. So if you go out in the middle of the day and you take off your clothes and you sit out in the sun for two hours and you haven't done that often, you're going to get burned depending on your skin type. 
If, however, you start out by getting morning sun at sunrise and preconditioning as much of your skin as possible, you can absorb more ultraviolet light in the afternoon and midday than you would normally be able to, to the point where the most fair skinned person can probably be out in the sun all day long, naked, and be totally fine. Uh, yes. I used to actually burn a fair bit in my early 20s doing landscaping, and now I almost become South African. I think it becomes dark. Yes. Because of that preconditioning that the last 15 years I've just been figuring out how to improve the quality of my skin. It so, helps. How much time do you say it's a uh, optimum amount of time to be like on a sunrise? Well, so here's the, I'll give you the optimum. Um, and I'll tell you a story too. Like I did this, I did the same thing. Like I had darker skin, but um, I, I would also burn if I just, you know, took my shirt off, wore my shorts in the middle of the sun in the summer um, without preconditioning. So I preconditioned this year. And Heidi and I were actually out in New York City for a few days. We were out in short. I was just wearing shorts and no shirt. And we were with friends who were wearing, you know, T-shirts and long pants. We were out for an hour with them. We had been out all day. They're, our friends were out for an hour. They burned to a crisp. We were out all day long in Boston for two days and New York City for two days. I just had shorts on. I was, I was barely tan, but I was tan. And they were burned to a crisp after an hour. So the preconditioning makes a really big difference. Um, at least I've seen that in action. The, the, so the minimum amount of time in, at so sunrise, within a half hour of sunrise, so within 30 minutes of sunrise is the I'm most ideal. And my experience says five minutes is the bare minimum. The optimal amount of time is to start at sunrise and stay outside until the UV light comes into the atmosphere. So this, the ultraviolet is always coming from the sun, but it can't enter the atmosphere until the sun's at a certain angle. And usually it depends on the time of year, but in the summer at our latitude, it's going to be like 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, you're going to start to get ultraviolet rays um, in the morning. And your body is looking for that transition from no ultraviolet to ultraviolet to help maintain optimal health. So basically it's gonna shut down this hormone cascade that's been going on all night and is influenced also by morning sunlight. The ultraviolet can shut that hormone cascade off, puts the nitric oxide in the mitochondrial chain to slow it down, to decrease our need for food, but at the same time continues to ramp up the spin of the ATPase, make, making more energy without more food. Um, and so that transition is, is key if you can get it. Otherwise, five minutes in morning sun or if you really like, if you work a night shift and you can't get out at dawn, then evening sun at sunset is beneficial, but just not as good as morning sun from what I've seen of the studies. So preconditioning skin, um, setting our body's time clocks, very important. Um, the hormone cascade that we want. And then um, I call these like photon traps. So that's, a, that's another term where aromatic amino acids like tyrosine and tryptophan basically have like a, a circular um, benzene ring, they call it structure, and they are trapping photon information and then coding themselves to later become hormones that we need like melatonin in the pineal. So it tells us when should tryptophan become melatonin, when should it become serotonin, and when should it be encoded to change and release from the pineal. There's a lot of information we're finding is transferred from sunlight. This is just like a cartoon of the research study that was done on ATP synthase. So basically you've got this like electron chain transporter and you shove a bunch of food electrons through it to make energy. So if you put a nitric oxide to slow everything down between cytochromes one through three, then this guy doesn't get any electrons or they're very slow. So you slow down how much energy you make when the nitric oxide is in there. And that's why like red light therapy, photobiomodulation works because we're putting red and infrared light on our body to increase energy, decrease inflammation because we're spinning this guy faster and red light removes the nitric oxide from this cell mitochondria cycle. So like red light therapy, if you're using that in an infrared sauna, what time of day is that? It's a really good question ideally when the sun is up. So infrared and red is present 100% of the time when the sun is up. So if you're doing it when the sun is up, that's perfect. If you're doing it after sunset or before sunrise, some people's schedules I'll make that the only way that you can do it, but it's not ideal to do a lot of sauna yeah. after sunset. I do, I do, I, like for 
Right. Maybe sometimes the ideal, not the ideal time, but I think like after my son goes to sleep, it's like I'll go. I know, right? You finally can relax. <laughs> and I'll put the red light on and so it's probably better in the morning. It's, it's better in the morning or right before sunset or any time during the day. However, <laughs> bless you. Um, that's how I would do it as well. Like I would do it at night. I light, and I'll, I might have some photos in here, but I light my house at night with red lights. Yeah. The human body, that intensity of bright red light, the body is still not really designed from a circadian biology standpoint to make use of all that red light at night. Um, so I've been switching to red to get rid of the, you know, all the LED, even in the incandescent and halogen at night have enough blue to reduce uh, melatonin by 40%. Yeah, so basically, even with incandescent and halogen, you're giving up, you're, you're telling yourself you're gonna give up 40% of your melatonin production. Um, I, I don't think that graph is in here, but I've got a graph from a study where they show every kind of light and how much melatonin it affects. And so o, OLEDs are 2% melatonin reduction, the same as a candle. But, a, but an OLED is very challenging to find. Like, I don't even think I can... OLED? OLED, you can look them up. I can only find commercial grade OLEDs that you can buy as like light panels that you can embed like as a wall sconce or something. But I know they're gonna be coming for regular lighting. And I know the lighting companies that do LEDs are gonna take out the blue and put in the softer, um, warmer lights so that it helps entrain your circadian biology, but they're just, they're not out yet. OLED. Yeah, OLED. You can, no, you, yes, you can in a minute. Um, and so basically, like if you want like the technical details, what's happening with red and infrared is this ATPase motor is like, a, you can and picture it like a diamond in water and the infrared reduces the viscosity of the water. So when water viscosity is reduced, the motor can spin faster. And you can do that by continuing to push protons, hydrogens through the system and create ATP without electrons. Hey, buddy. You can hit this one, this down arrow. So basically what you're doing is like uncoupling food from mitochondrial energy production. So this is just, you know, kind of a, a cartoon of, you know, can sunlight provide energy? And, and most people have that experience where in the summer, you're just like, well, I don't have to eat as much food in the summer. It's really hot or whatever. And possibly some of that is because we're getting more of our energy from sunlight. I want to push it. Okay, hang on. Why don't you push it down? So just as a summary, like we went through this, but basically helping us sleep, setting our circadian biology, providing information. So some of that information is, if you think about how mitochondria are affected by diseases, it's because they, they, they get problems with energy production and they have to switch energy production often from like a beta oxidation, so burning, able, ability to burn fat, to losing that ability and only being able to burn glucose or doing anaerob anaerobic fermentation through a whole different mechanism. That's usually called like the Warburg shift. And the Warburg shift we're thinking happens because the cell is unable to make energy in any other way. So in order to preserve itself, it must switch metabolism. And the information from the sunlight in the morning provides your cells with the data that it needs for apoptosis and autophagy to clean all those cells up before that metabolism shifts. Go ahead, bud. Now, obviously, that's the problem. This is the problem: is the the indoor lifestyle. We talk about ninety percent of our time indoors. So, what happens now is this is the lighting that we get: exactly. LED overhead, LED on your monitor, LED on your phone, LED on your television, LED on your tablet, and very little natural light. I'm going to need those, bud. Thanks. And so when you're in this indoor environment, these LED lights that we created, compact fluorescent, fluorescent lights, every one of those is designed to save companies money on energy. They are not designed for human biology. And so we, we are putting energy savings above human health right now. And of course, a lot of this research is very new and we're learning it now. But the fact of the matter is that majority of the light from LEDs is blue wavelengths of light, high spikes of blue. There is no red and no infrared in most LED. There's no ultraviolet in LED. There's no, there's, there's like a tiny bit of ultraviolet in incandescent, halogen, and fluorescent. Um, you can get a black light fluorescent and then there's gonna be a bunch of ultraviolet at one wavelength. Um, but we're getting massive spikes of blue light in our eyes 
and on our skin all day long without the red and infrared, which in nature always balance blue, and without the ultraviolet telling our neuropsin and the other opsin receptors in our cells, hey guys, you can sit here or you can go back there for now. You can push this one button and then it'll be time. Go ahead and push it. So what's happening is when we get, can you sit down? There's people that want to see you too. Can you sit down here? Thanks. When we get too much blue light in our eyes, it causes free radicals, reactive oxygen species. So a lot of the latest research, all the papers from the dermatology institutes are showing that blue light in the eye, creating all those free radicals can cause macular degeneration. And then the theory is eventual blindness if we get too much free radical in the eye all the time without balancing it with the red, the infrared, the ultraviolet. So this is just basically a spectrum showing midday. So this is midday sun. This is sunrise and sunset. Hey, bud. Go sit down over here behind the projector or over there. And then this is incandescent. So when we talk about like what, how much blue is in an incandescent, there's not a ton of blue. There's a lot of red. There's some infrared. Um, but that's an incandescent. Again, even incandescent doesn't model the sun. And you can see the sun changes throughout the day. This is a fluorescent. This is um, hard to see, but this is an LED. So this is a cool white LED with a giant spike of blue. Um, no light here, no light here, almost no red and inf no red, no infrared and almost no red. This is a warm white LED and there's a spike of blue that's not quite as big as this and a little bit more yellow. So the top one is the sunlight. Top one. So the top left is midday sun okay. and the top right is sunrise and sunset. Okay. Yeah. What is this in the middle right here? Incandescent. Yeah, so that's like these lights, incandescent halogens. Hey guys, can you please stop? Thank you. So it's the best one. Fluorescent. It's the better one out of all. So if you had to choose um, one of these lights and you can't choose sunlight, you know, my preference today is halogen most mimics this profile. I don't have halogen up here. Then incandescent. And then uh, like red and in, you can get red and infrared LEDs. And I'll show you a photo of that. Um, or you can get like a very low watt halogen. So halogens take a lot of energy and they produce a lot of heat, but you can get a low watt halogen these days for during the day. I still wouldn't use those at night. Like night, proper nighttime lighting would really be firelight. All of human history, after dark, we've seen moonlight and we've seen firelight and that's it. Up until the Edison light bulb, which is this one, the incandescent in early 1900s. Hey guys, come on, can you go over there? We've never seen anything but that. So the electric lighting changed things. And then with LED lighting, because of these different spikes, fluorescent and LED, that really changed how our body reacts to lights. So you can also get like the very warmest LED that you can find. So when I say warm, it's like warm color, so more yellow. And the way you find that is you look for an LED that has a color temperature. They all have a color temperature on them of 3000 Kelvin or less. Some of them are tunable where you can tune the color temperature. Ideally, 2600 Kelvin is what you want. 27. So 2700 Kelvin is good. That's about the best right now you can get from an LED that I know of is anything under 3000. If you really want to geek out on it, you can get like a color rendering index CRI of 95 or above. And then you can go another rate of get like the lowest flicker rate or maybe the highest flicker rate LED. So LEDs tend to flicker and you can measure that with a flicker meter and our biology, our brain notices it, even if our eyes don't, and it tends to cause stress. Same with fluorescence, where an incandescent and halogen, um, they work on heat. So we have alternating current electricity moving back and forth, shutting the LED off 60 times every second. And then that tends to flicker, um, where an incandescent light, it won't ever turn off because it's made from heat. So it continues to glow after the power is shut off. So if you get an LED that has like flickers 3,000 3, times a second, your brain would never pick that up. Um, so if you get one that never flickers or has a flicker rate your brain cannot comprehend, um, it won't see it as flicker. But if we get one of those that's in that range where it flickers a little bit, our body picks that up as stress. Sometimes you'll see that when you're recording a video. Exactly. You record a screen and you can kind of see it flicker. Yeah. So that's a good indication that that's, that will cause stress because the flicker is low enough that even your camera can pick it up. So if this, this uh, LED, it's still not as uh, optimal as the halogen, right? Halogen is still the best one.
during the day. But at night, at night, I would I would say that LED are probably going, going to be the ones you're, that we will change to when they come up with better LEDs, because halogen and incandescent at night still reduce melatonin by forty percent, and we don't want to give up forty percent of our body's master anti-cancer hormone. Eighty, a lot. So eight, you're giving up eighty percent, or the. So, and that, and that's exactly that we only learned that we had photoreceptors in our skin in December, 2017, the very first paper came out finding melanopsin in the subcutaneous fat, the skin and the blood vessels. Um, there's also now UVC receptors in our blood vessels and sub Q fat. UVC doesn't come from the sun. I mean, it does, but it doesn't enter our atmosphere. So NASA tells us. So, so wait, you said the halogen that like they reduce melatonin, melatonin production by 40%? Yes. And uh, the LED by 80? Yes. Well, why would you be using that at night then? So why would you use that at night? Because you're going to get an LED that's not bright white with that giant spike of blue light. You're going to get an LED with almost no blue light. Oh. So I use LEDs at night that only have red light. Like they have a very specific wavelength of red light. One wavelength of red, it's 660 nanometers and nothing else. So I know that there's only red light coming from that LED. You could get some with only, you know, like yellow red light as well. So they exist. I'm, I'm saying that in the very near future, they will sell LEDs without the blue light component because of what we know on circadian biology. So today, if I was to tell you what to use, red LED, candlelight, firelight, um, or nothing is ideal. If you have to use something, I would opt for an incandescent if you've got to use a light. As use an incandescent, it has the least impact of the other lights, um, or a very warm 2700 Kelvin LED. And then, you know, if you really want to get crazy about it, baseball hat, a pair of glasses so the blue light doesn't get into your eye, and then long sleeves. How do you feel about true darkness? I will show you. We're coming. I actually did a. Um, test of all of those glass. I've got 30 pairs of blue blockers and I tested them last week and I put a little chart together at the end of the presentation that I'll share with you. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so. These block blue lights. Yes, they do. So if you can see this, this is what we talked about light changing during the day. No um, ultraviolet light in the morning, then ultraviolet light comes in and, and then it wanes. And we might think like, okay, why does that matter? Well, if we have neuropsin that senses ultraviolet and, and codes for what our body should do based on the ultraviolet light, when ultraviolet comes on and it's strong, calories are, we're, we're awake, we're eating, we're moving. When the ultraviolet wanes and then goes away, the neuropsin senses that and it knows darkness is coming and it sets your circadian biology to start producing and getting ready to produce melatonin and getting you ready for rejuvenating during sleep. So again, this is just, you know, again, the fluorescent, incandescent, um, LED, and then sunlight. And so none of those obviously mimic natural sunlight at any single point. And again, what, what I mentioned is like indoors, blue light is completely imbalanced. We're getting huge doses of blue light, but in nature, blue is 100% of the time balanced by red always. So we talked a little bit about this, but blue light, these are what, what the studies show um, happens to your body with blue light exposure after dark. And the other thing that many people don't know is melanoma and melasma, so discoloration of the skin is caused by the blue light of our screens and our LEDs, not by sunlight. And it can be helped, melasma, melanoma, by sunlight and by red and infrared light from like photobiomodulation. UV therapy, UV therapy um, yes, and you have to be careful with that, obviously, of how much exposure you're getting. But you know, my, my recommendation to most people living in a northern climate or not getting out enough is to do some sort of UV therapy. You have to be careful with UV therapy, but I, I definitely think it's worthwhile um, investigating and doing. So one of the things that blue light does, especially after dark, is it stimulates insulin, 
and it messes up our leptin hormone as well. So two things that are intimately tied to glucose control and weight. And so there's numerous studies that link cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, heart disease to exposure to light at night. Most of those studies are done on nurses and, and hospital staff. Um, but essentially like we're telling our body that it's the middle of the day and calories are plentiful and uh, that's not what should be happening at night. So it's a mismatch between what's really happening and what we're telling our body. And again, if we're gonna destroy, I need you to sit um, right here and watch or go walk around in the back for a little bit. Thank you. We're destroying like the dopamine signals and even the DHA. So when we get too much blue light, both through our retina, so where's the most amount of DHA in our body? It's in our retina, our brain and our heart. And so through our eye, when we're getting too much blue light, we are destroying some of the coupled systems that we have between DHA, vitamin A, and the, and the mela, melanopsin. And we're not getting the dopamine signal we'd be getting from sunlight. And so we typically tend to do more social media and more food therapy and things like that when we're in this indoor environment because we're looking for that dopamine hit. So addiction. Yes, addiction is... Um, my opinion, very related to the amount of blue light the body is getting because you're losing out on the dopamine hit from sunlight. And so you need to feed other things to your system to get the hits of dopamine. And when we design social media and video games and, and food to be like so awesome for our biology, it's very easy to fall into those things and have lower dopamine that we need to keep bringing up from missing sunlight. So I used to say this until very recently that blue light is the major non-native EMF. So all sunlight is um, light. So microwaves, radio waves, Wi-Fi, that's all just different versions of light. And of course we know cell phones send information from one phone to another through the cellular signal. That's just a light signal. So we absolutely know that light contains information and passes that on because you can send an email and it gets there wirelessly. Um, same thing with sunlight. And when we're getting only blue light all the time, all day and all night, that's a big problem. I would argue after going through the EMF retreat that we had that I was going to say that 5G is gonna be a bigger deal than blue light, um, but what we know of the skin and the skin surfaces and how they're impacted by EMF and blue light and that melanopsin is tied to retinol in the skin that 5G, 4G and 3G are all major non-native EMFs that probably trump even blue light. Um, but again, the, the research is still coming out and we're still learning a ton about all that every single day. One of the things I think it's really interesting in your space too, when people are really interested in food and diet, and we look at studies, we look at a lot of biochemical studies, think about what blue light does. So increases insulin, messes with leptin, changes appetite, changes glucose metabolism, and then think about every one of those studies on laboratory animals and humans are done in a blue lit laboratory environment. How is that going to change the result and the impact that those studies have on our biology versus under natural sunlight? So I would just question a little bit more a lot of the science of those studies, especially because these types of animals where a majority of our studies are done have different opsins than humans have their vitamin A is much stronger bonded covalently to the melanopsin in their eye, so it's not broken apart as easily as humans. So when we do studies on mice and rats who have different melanopsin mechanisms and different retinol mechanisms in their body, they may yield different results than if we did those in vivo on humans. So just a slide that our environment makes a big difference and we just need to be careful about how we're, how we're living in that environment. So Jack Cruz, if you guys know him probably, but very controversial figure, super intelligent dude, has a lot of good information and helps, helps me kind of direct my research. Um, he doesn't rub everyone the right way, but uh, he's got a lot of info. So, you know, based on understanding this information about light, you know, what do we do with that? So number one is like, Getting outside at sunrise is the most important thing. And if you work in an office building with very little natural light during the day, then getting out for like smoke break. So people can get outside for five minutes to go smoke a cigarette. Used to do that in the past. You can get out for five minutes and get some sunlight in your eyes and on your body during the day. 
There's so many benefits that you receive from entraining your circadian biology and absorbing those photons and the information from sunlight. It's not something that you want to avoid. So this is my workout setup. So I do live in Wisconsin, so it gets really cold during the winter. So well, during, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this was last week. Um, I do. So I still go out in my shorts in the middle of winter, unless it's 20 below, but all the way up till 15 below, I will be outside every single day. And I just posted on the, somebody asked me the other day on how I do this in the winter. And there's a reason you do it in the winter, because if we're finding um, UVC receptors in our blood, in our vessels, and no UVC gets through the atmosphere from the sun, where's the UVC coming from? So the theory is that blue light from the sun in winter, when the body is cold and only when it's cold, blue light can, can press on the sub-Q fat in the skin and create UVC and UVB light in the arteries and veins. Um, so that's a theory that's being posited. We know that ultraviolet light pushes on the skin, creates nitric oxide, which pushes up on the subcutaneous fat to squeeze the vessels. And if you've got deuterium in the vessels, that can create light. UVC light. So that's where the theory right now is why do we have UVC receptors in the body? Maybe because we're making UVC light, very low levels of UVC light in the body to make use of it during times when we don't have UVB in northern latitudes, which would be from now until May 15th um, from the sun. <laughs> so a lot of time up here without UVB light. Uh, so I recommend like as much as possible working out outdoors. So you, Working out in a blue lit gym and having to cover yourself up, um, maybe not the best. There's some research that shows you make like singlet oxygen species instead of triplet oxygen when you're working out under blue light in an indoor environment. So working out outdoors can be beneficial. And of course, like in the winter, I'm cross country skiing and hiking and taking walks outside. And I do get out at sunrise, like I said, it's really cold, but I just do like 200 jumping jacks and then a couple push ups, and then I go inside. You don't have to be out for long in the winter, um, but it is helpful. So again, covering up at night. So as I'm standing under blue light and looking at my screen, um, you know, having a pair of blue blockers and I've got a good slide coming up next. Because of what we know that blue light penetrates something like four centimeters into the body, maybe it's four millimeters. Um, and I was trying to find out like how far is the thyroid under the skin? And it's like only a couple millimeters under the skin or so. So if blue light is penetrating to the thyroid, which is the most exposed organ in our body besides the skin, which is our largest organ, we can be deaf and we're definitely messing up the photo entrainment, the light information of the thyroid when we're exposing that at night. So people are even saying like, wear, wear a scarf at night. And I mean, there's only so much many people are willing to do. But if you want like the full picture, like scarf, hat, glasses to block your eyes, and then just minimizing the light sources at night, just like all of human history would be ideal, or just um, have some fire. What are your thoughts on salt lamps? I use salt lamps and I have like five of them because I thought that was the way to go. And in some cases I like remove the incandescent light and put a red LED in the salt lamp just to like make it even harder to see. <laughs> which is like great for a nightlight for the kids, but you can't read by those. So I do use a salt lamp um, like on either side of my bed. And so I've got an incandescent light in there. I will cover one of them like with a t-shirt so that it's even less light. And then I wear blue blockers and then I read a book by the salt lamp. Um, you don't have to be as crazy as I am, but I do think like if you're gonna have incandescent light on at night, putting it in a salt rock lamp is way better than just having it naked, I guess, for sure. So the, be the best is not have a light at all, right? Like a candlelight. So even candlelight drops melatonin by like 2%, which really I would say is a wash, it doesn't affect melatonin. So ideally like moonlight and starlight um, have a lux of like 0 0.001 lux, or even 0.1 maybe at the highest. A dim nightlight is like, five to a hundred lux. So we think moonlight is super bright. It's not affecting our melatonin. Firelight probably isn't. So ideally like complete darkness is, is ideal, but if you let in the moonlight and the starlight, that's fine. You just don't want to let in the LED street lights. So even the American Medical Association, you can Google this. They put a warning letter out two years ago. Um, so I was learning all this. I gave a, a TEDx talk on, on blue light and the eye and circadian rhythm. 
And I was, I picked up this American Medical Association letter and they warned not to change streetlights to LED streetlights because of circadian disruption in humans at night and the health impact. So even the American Medical Association like has a warning letter about this and still most people don't know about it. <laughs> How do they know? <laughs> Based on a lot of your slides, you wrote like how you don't eat as much food. Like for you personally, like how has that impacted your caloric intake? And so I was arguing about this two weeks ago here with the um, Ben House and Mike T. Nelson, like two PhD guys in biochemistry. And they're like, that's impossible. Like, how does that work? And so I tried to explain and they're like, well, we need to see the studies on the equator with someone who's naked versus someone in the lab. And I'm like, that'd be a great study. Actually, I, I would like to see that too. So they, they were claiming like, no matter what, no matter how many photons you're getting, you still need enough food electrons to gain muscle mass because they're all about like yeah. building more muscle mass. And that's um, something in my experience that I can gain muscle mass on less calories. And I've documented that on my blog where everyone was like, you're not eating enough calories, but yet I gained 13 pounds of muscle. What? Um, Yes. I mean, I, I was doing a round of like SARMs, selective androgen receptor modulators. They're like designer, they're not steroids, but they're designer peptides that act on the androgen receptors like a steroid without the downsides. So everyone was talking about them. I couldn't find anyone that had experience with it that was posting. I'm not a professional athlete. So I posted about use of those maintaining calories and I gained um, 13 pounds of muscle and I measured with DEXA scan before and after as well as calipers and the scale and photos. And so I did gain without additional calories. And I know other people who have done the same thing. So anecdotally, I'm convinced that that can work, um, but I'd still like to see more studies. Now it's great to see like an in vivo study to prove how that's working. But I, I do notice like I eat less food in the summer and I'm not dropping body mass as long as I'm keeping my movement the same. So here's the slide you guys wanted, hopefully. So here's the true dark day walkers. Here's the true dark twilight. Here's the DeWalt laser glasses. These are six bucks. The UVEX glasses, these are $8.99. These are raw optics and these are Swannies. I will say Swannies um, had some problems at first. So I measured one, the ones I'm wearing, 510. Like that's pretty good, 510 nanometers. That is, if you look at the wavelengths, it, it's pretty much all the blue and a little bit of the cyan. And so like, I'm good with that. Like, that's not bad. I wouldn't really want them as my go-tos at night, but during the day, and if I had to use them at night, totally fine. I measured another pair of Swannies and they were like way down here at like 450. Um, so just two different pairs were really inconsistent. I did post this and um, Tristan and Stephanie from the Swanwick company contacted me and they're like, we changed our lenses a year and a half ago and they're more consistent. So they're gonna send me another pair to test. I believe them because these are new. The ones I tested that were super low were old. But I'll tell you what, like I trained with Dave. I'm a certified bulletproof coach. Um, but the Daywalker glasses, when I tested them, they tested at 410. That's not even blue light. That's not even like violet light. We're down into like almost ultraviolet. So they're, they really won't, my opinion, I only tested one pair. I will test more like Paleo FX and a few other places this year. They did not even block blue light. Um, so I do recommend testing. I recommend highly like Dave's and True Dark's um, from the Biohack company, the Twilights. Like they may look kind of alien, but if you're at home, like they really block a lot of light and it's really hard to see with those on. Same with these uh, DeWalt. So like these are 80 bucks, these are six. So depending on your preference, uh, they block roughly the same, the same amount of light. And then the raw optics are the ones that I wear almost exclusively because they just look really good and they block a really good amount of light. Um, these are raw optics. It's raw, the sun guide. So Matt Maruka, he's an 18 year old kid. He invented these after like learning all this stuff about light, super entrepreneurial. He now has a joint venture with um, Rick Rubin um, to bring a lot of this light and health and blue blocking information to like rock stars, which is Rick Rubin's forte. So um, super young kid, super high energy. Um, he created this company. So I like to support him. I like his glasses a lot because they're really stylish like the Swannies, but they block way more light than the Swannies do. Raw optics. raw optics, raw optics. How much? 
Uh, I think they run from like 79 to 129 and he's in a process of revamping all his stuff because 5G um, has jump conduction. So basically like when you get so much high energy from a 5G um, Wi-Fi cell microwave environment, you start moving um, to any metallic or conducting surface charge to that surface. So the metal wings of glasses right by the eye getting conduction through those from 5G may, may not be good for the eyes. So he is trying to create a new version that has no metal uh, in these wings of the glasses, just in case that ends up being a problem. So, yes. Um, I guess so for your computer, um, like obviously ideal is not to use it at all at night, but like do you recommend Iris Flux, Iris? I use Iris and I'll, I'm using Iris now. So that's why it looks a little orange. Yeah. Um, at night, I change it to the sleep or the biohacker setting. I'll show you. I can show you real quick. I'm right here. So, I have both, but I always, I so like this is what I do at night or there's a biohacker setting. If you're doing color work, it's not going to work for you. <laughs> so um, the artists in the family can't do that, but I can certainly work on sleep mode. It definitely um, makes it interesting when I look at my slides and I'm like, oh my God, that's not the color that I wanted. That doesn't convey the same message. So like, what time do you switch? Like, because if you're inside, I mean... Sun, so I still want to entrain myself to the sun. The sun. So I always want to be in sync with the sun, like I naturally would be throughout human history. Okay. So, so my personal opinion is when the sun sets, this is, this is going on to the sleep setting. My, sungla my sunglasses are going on as soon as the sun sets. You probably can. I don't even bother. I just leave it on the health setting during the day. And then as soon as the sun sets, I change it to the um, sleep setting. I know flux changes with so flux changes geographically and with time. The problem is if you look on Dr. Mercola's site, he took a spectrometer and I haven't done it with mine yet, but he measured flux at its full capacity and it was not blocking blue light. Right. It still let through a lot of blue light and Iris didn't let through hardly any blue light. And so... Yeah, so most people like changed over from Flux. What about for your phone? So on my phone, I've got Iris Mini. On Android, it's free. On iPhone, you got to pay for it. Um, but iPhone, Iris Mini is on Android. It's free. Um, I use that. You can also, I believe now, absolutely Apple has a brightness setting called Night Shift. Yeah. And you can actually go into a further setting and make and dial the blue um, wavelengths down and the orange and red up by manually setting that. So you can do that yourself. Um, Android has a, their own version of night shift. I can't remember what it's called, but it's in your brightness settings. You can enable that. Yeah. Okay. I would now, if you look at my laptop, it's backlit. And so I can't change the backlighting of it. When I open the fridge, although I, hacked my fridge now too, like big bright LED light in my refrigerator when I go to put something away at night or get something out for the next day or like somebody flips on a light or even when I'm walking by the windows and there's this blaring street lights, um, I just want to protect against all that. So I do still wear the glasses even though I've got that, those settings on there. Yeah. With your glasses, have you noticed like I know the UVX ones and the True Darts, they kind of cup around your eye with like the shielding on the side where the ones you're wearing are just like these let a lot of light through the side. So I like, here's, here's my protocol. Like I have a lot of these glasses. Um, cause I've been doing this for many years at home sunsets. I put on the UVX when I'm at home, they wrap, I, I can see out of them really well. When I put on these, I can't see very well. Like I fall around the house. It's not, it's like kind of dangerous. These are Swannies. Um, so what I do is I throw these in my, in my car and I throw, and I throw a pair of these in my car. These are so cheap. I just bought a few pairs. Um, and I throw a pair of those and a pair of Swannies in my car. So when I'm driving, I put on the UVEX. And when I have to go into a building or talk to people at night, I put on the Swannies. That's only if I forget my glasses or I wear these in the gym during the day. Otherwise, I have my raw optics, which these aren't the ones I've got, but I've got mine here. They wrap. So my raw optics still look really stylish, but wrap enough that I'm not getting a bunch of light filtering. And if these are blocking blue and the lights coming from the side and bouncing back into my eye, not probably not ideal. So like I, I'll put these on 
when the sun sets in an hour, half hour before bed, I put one of these two on just to like completely shut things down. And it's, I mean, it's pretty hard to stay awake. Like when you really shut out the light, just like when you're camping, you're like, it's nine o'clock and I'm super tired. Like your body knows it's time to. Ideally you want, so I've got blackout curtains. You want natural sunlight in the morning. So you do want natural sunlight in the morning. What I have found, so, so I, I thought that, like I thought like I'm just going to sleep through like the morning sun. I don't wake to an alarm. I mean, sometimes I set one just to like don't oversleep or if I have to get up at five in the morning. What I found is when I get out at sunrise every day, and I've been doing that now for two years, I don't have to try to wake up at sunrise. I don't need the light coming in. I, my body is like, it's time to get up. And it, I'm like, oh, it's still too dark. It can't be that early. But I'll, I'll look at my phone, which is on airplane mode next to my bed. And it's like, it's sunrise. So I'm getting up. Do you have an app that you use to like, tell you what the sunrise is every morning? Or do you just kind of... Uh, D-Minder should tell you that. D-Minder? D-Minder tells you how much vitamin D you can absorb from the sun at any time of the year. So it'll say like, hey, it's September 20th. You can't get any more vitamin D from the sun at your latitude. But it'll tell you sunrise and sunset. The Weather Channel app tells you sunrise and sunset too. Um, so all that happens. So I like to do, again, within a half hour of sunrise, just be outside. There's got to be. So I'm sure there's an app for it. You got, yeah, I'd say an hour. Like if you do, if you do the first hour, I'm going to say you're probably fine within the first hour. Once you go beyond that hour and UV comes in, it's a different um, light picture. Yes, absolutely. I, so here's what I would do if I wore a prescription is I would get the blue tech, um, light filter for, for your normal pair. So they're going to have a tiny yellow tint, but not bad. These days they almost look clear. And then you're going to, that's going to block like 450. So like the most intense, the HEV, the high intensity blue light from getting into your eye from devices. And then if I had the money, so if I had enough money, what I would do is get a second pair of prescriptions and tell your optometrist to to tint them to 550, 550 BPI tint. They know exactly what that is. They may have it, or they may say, go to this guy next door and he's got it. They just take your lenses out and they dip them and they're gonna look red. So it's that red raw optics or the DeWalt. That's for the night, for the evening. BPI. That's for the evening. Correct, 550 BPI. So I, if I had prescriptions, I would have two pair. I'd have a 550 BPI for sunset and I'd have the regular blue tech lenses for during the day. And if I'm outside, I would kind of do this and let the sun get into my eyes okay. during the day if I'm out. Yeah, because that's my biggest issue is with, I don't wear contacts, so none of those glasses fit over top. Yeah. So yep. actually, it's True Dark has fit over this. They do. They do, yeah. yeah. Oh. Actually, the yeah the True Dark Twilights they have inserts that pop out of those glasses I showed, so they'll fit over. Oh, okay. Yeah, and and the um, the Uvex glasses will fit over as well. Okay. Yeah. What are your thoughts on sun I'll tell you my thoughts, um, and I'm, I'm going to tell nobody copy what I do because it's not safe. That being said, I stare directly at the sun, and I've been doing it for years at sunrise, and I will not do it when there's UV present. Um, so sunrise and sunset, I'll spend 15 minutes staring at the sun. Um, and I worked up to that. They say, like, there's a sun gazing protocol. Mm -hmm. And there's this whole, you get special powers from like staring at the sun and being grounded. There's, there, they know stuff, you know, like there's reasons why people have talked and done that in every culture forever. And so they say, start out at 10 seconds and it must be within 30 minutes of sunrise or sunset. Ideally, you're grounded to the earth and it's 10 seconds. And then the next day it's 20 and then 40. And you work your way up over time in that, in that manner. So I stare directly at the sun. But again, I'm not going to tell anyone to, to copy me, but um, I don't wear prescription glasses. I've been doing that for a long time. And I do feel that that benefits us if we do it build, building up slow. Um, but I don't recommend that anybody do that. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, do, I definitely do that. And I find that it, it's beneficial for me. Great yeah. For you. Does the health mode of virus block blue light enough that it won't get the thyroid because laptops are... I don't think so. So you can hover over the, you can hover over each setting in Iris. It'll tell you the color temperature. So the health setting, let's see. Uh, it was doing this for me earlier where it was actually, maybe it was down here. Nope. 
when my computer is running faster, it will tell you the um, color temperature and the health color temperature is 4,676 Kelvin. So 4676, so that's, a, that's still letting some blue light through. But you have to remember like during the day, blue light is totally fine. Like blue light is not harmful. It's not harmful unless it's unbalanced. So when we, when we take away red, like if, if I'm here in front of these windows or if I've got my laptop in front of natural light, I'm not gonna worry about it. You got plenty of red light coming through. So this is what I had done to, to our kitchen and our bathroom. These are 660 nanometer red and I think 830 nanometer infrared. So infrared is invisible um, because like you gotta be able to see some stuff. So, and I can't carry a candle everywhere all the time. So like <laughs> this works, it looks really weird from the outside of the house looking in, um, but it works well. Like if you're really wanting to like geek out about this, you can like this light from Amazon, it screws into any light fixture. It's like $12. So it, it's not that expensive if you pick out the right stuff. Again? I'll have to send you a link, but it's called 660NM, so 660 nanometer. It's just a grow light, like people that grow hydroponics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you're growing um, farmer's market hydroponic food. <laughs> so you look up um, 660 nanometer grow light on Amazon and you'll find it for like 12, 13 bucks. Buyers above this also buy. <laughs> <laughs> right? The blue grow light and... <laughs> you put your bathroom, the, the actual light? No, you can't, right? Because during the day, you... Gonna... During the day, I've got um, incandescent and halogen lights. Right. If I need them. and But I don't use lights during the day and I yeah, tend so. not to use them at night. Um, so, like, during the day, like, these are okay during the day. Like, there's no problem with those. Um, but at night, like, that, it's not ideal. If you want optimal, you want no light or you want firelight and then if you're moving away from optimal you want red light and then further away from optimal you want incandescent and halogen um, the other thing is like based on circadian biology we shouldn't be eating after dark so like that's always been kind of a theory of people and people have said that and i think now we've got definitive studies that are showing that people that eat after sunset have higher body mass index and higher rates of obesity so <laughs> <laughs> Shut down. We talked about this, so phone, laptop, iPad, television, you can put all these filters on them. I do, I use um, Iris on all my stuff just because it was, uh, it was like $2 to buy the full version of Iris for my laptop or something. I don't know what it costs nowadays. I don't, it might be like, I think, again, if you have an Apple, you have, you have to buy a subscription, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, it's, it's cheap, it's very cheap. So pro appropriate lighting at night, you know, would be dark or moonlight, really. Firelight if you're going to stretch it, and then red light if you need something. And then if you've got kids doing homework, um, you know, you might have to have some incandescent or halogen. So supplementing light, photobiomodulation, ultraviolet light therapy, creating vitamin D in the winter. You know, all these things are, are things to look into, especially if you live more of an indoor life and you're needing to mitigate that or if you're in a northern climate in the winter. You can fly down south for multiple times during the winter. You can get outside naked in the blue light and the cold, and that's supposedly only cold and blue light work together to maybe create ultraviolet B and C in your body. Um, but you're really trying to balance because of our indoor life, we're trying to balance around the blue light that we're exposed to all the time. And I think that's the most critical. So of course, like if you're trying to solve a problem, figure out what's in your environment that could be causing a bigger issue than anything else before you start, you know, diving into like the minutia of what diet should I eat um, if your environment is the biggest cause of, of your issue. So that's what I've got. It's just trying to give more awareness around light and health and how the two are really interrelated. And hopefully, you know, you guys have a lot more to think about than you did before. So thank you. All right. And with that, we'll turn that light off. Actually, something I found interesting, back to the rat studies, I was reading that the pheromones of the handlers of the rats will change. Oh. So was it a woman that was handling the rats or a man will have a different outcome? Interesting. In rat studies. So now we're like, do you even trust rat studies anymore <laughs> like, at all? There's so many. When we learn so much about yeah. what impacts yeah, biology. Really, and they 
feel it's like really hard. With the women, it would be dependent on their cycle because obviously they have like different yeah. pheromones being produced so with levels of progesterone and estrogen. Oh my god! Like, <laughs> now what? <laughs> I can't believe any of it now. Yeah, we have to have robots do it all. <laughs> oh, that's bad. Go ahead. Uh, one of my foster studies, and they called it yeah. inevitable bond. And yeah. We made it oh, yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter. Just your presence alone excuse yeah. everything. And so you can test it like, systematically. Yeah. That's, yeah, the quantum, yeah. 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 quantum Zeno effect. 1998. <laughs> Rap 42 is kind of a jerk. Pardon? Oh, there's this joke, it's a blog on the internet where these researchers are like, the study went 